The Point Overlook Museum is located above Wheeling, West Virginia, and overlooks the Ohio River Valley. Its panoramic view encompasses two states, three counties, and 12 miles of river view. The Point Overlook Museum has thousands of visitors throughout the year and can accommodate large or small groups. The Point Overlook Museum also offers a unique pictorial history of Wheeling's past and present. Throughout the museum, tourists can learn of Wheeling's early history through pictures and various artifacts. With the Point's enclosed observation deck, tourists can get a bird's eye view of the city of Wheeling. Since 1992, the Point has been an important stop among Wheeling's tourist attractions. It provides an educational experience for local residents as well as visitors to the city. The Ohio River is formed at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania by the joining of the Allegheny and Monongahela Rivers. From this convergence, it flows westward 981 miles to Cairo, Illinois, where it doubles the size of the Mississippi. The Ohio and its 18 tributaries make up a drainage basin the size of France, which is approximately 200,000 square miles. 18 modern locks and dams control the flow and enable ships and barges to navigate the 420-foot drop in elevation. After the 1936 and 37 floods, Congress approved a flood control plan, which authorized the building of up to 78 tributary dams, flood walls, and levees to protect urban areas along the main stem. Wheeling has had a long history of floods along the Ohio River. Shown here are a few photos from those early years, starting with the oldest known photo from 1852. Well, I'll tell you one of the most interesting stories that I heard, and it's one of the oldest stories of a flood that I've heard, and that was in the 1884 flood. Apparently, the island had livestock on it. Back in 1884, there were still farms over there. People had their own cows, chickens, things like that. And when the flood came up in 1884, there was a man telling me about a family that lived next door to his father. And they had a cow. Well, of course, where do you take your animals when the water comes up? So they took the cow and got it up on the second floor of the house. And apparently the flood stuck around for three or four days. So they had to figure out something to do in order to feed the cow. So they started pulling straw out of their mattresses. And that's how they fed their, their cow for a couple of days upstairs on the second story of their home. Well, that was one of the 1884 stories I heard, which I think is, uh, really gives you some, something to think about when you think of the island and all the livestock and everything that was over there.
there was something that was told to me just the other day about uh, the river and floods. And it was told to me by a man who basically he was talking about something his mother would always say, and it always seemed to hold true. That if the river came up and froze and left ice, it would always come back and get it. And basically what he must have meant was that if the river came up and, and, and would freeze and would go down too quickly, that it would always come back up and get its ice and take it back downstream again. It's kind of eerie, but I guess it was true. Tuesday morning, March 17th, uh, 1936, at 9 o'clock, WWVA received its first official warning from the Chamber of Commerce that high water was on its way to Wheeling and the surrounding country. The report advised a crest of 42 feet by Thursday morning, or six feet above flood stage. But a heavy snowfall followed by heavy rains in the Monongahela and Allegheny Valleys soon changed predictions, and an avalanche of water poured into the river valleys, which turn, in turn emptied uh, the swollen raging torrents into the Ohio River. And the crest predictions for Wheeling changed hourly, and by Wednesday at midnight, it was firmly established that the district would experience the most disastrous flood in its history. Foot by foot, the river rose with merciless persistency, and its roaring, devastating expanse of flood-maddened water carried with it both the works of man and nature in a furious rush down the Ohio Valley. But finally, at 3 p.m. Thursday, March 19th, this raging giant of destruction reached its peak at 54.5 feet at the Wheeling Wharf, or 18.5 feet above flood stage. A flood record which stood over for over half a century was broken by more than two feet, and history does not record higher water for Wheeling than the 1936 mark. Now, approximately eight square miles of business and residential property was underwater. Houses were completely submerged. Water reached the second floors of business establishments. Automobiles and motor trucks were abandoned and left to the mercy of flood waters. Trees were uprooted. Houses and garages were torn from their foundations and distributed for miles along the shores of the Ohio River. And damage ran well up into the millions. Countless unsung heroes, deeds of bravery, sacrifice without precedent, and an overwhelming evidence of unselfish devotion to friends and neighbors in dire distress, all combine to avert panic and minimize suffering. Silent and dramatic testimony of this service is evidenced in the fact that but 17 lives were lost in the greatest catastrophe which ever visited Wheeling and its vicinity. About the only thing I know about the 36 flood, since it was before my time, was that my mother and dad lived on 26th and Chaplin Street. And my mother had a picture of herself looking out of the second story window. And the water was not far from the bottom of the window, so in that picture. And I don't have the picture now, but I have seen it. And that's about all I know about the 36 flood. I'll tell you about this, the flood that I was five years old. We were living on Wood Street, just two doors from um, 40th Street. And I had never saw a flood before, and here this water was all around our house. 
and our steps, our front steps washed away. And <laughs> my mother said, I'm moving out of here and I'll never live in another flood. And she never did. She moved high and dry. <laughs> was never in another flood. Well, I lived at 2816 Chaplin Street. And we, we had a front porch. We had, I don't know how many steps went up the front porch to the first floor. But we piled all our furniture on the second floor. And the water came within three and a half inches of the second floor. And I got out of the, through the window on the porch roof, got in the boat. The guy took me, I took up to uh, old past Webster School, got out of the boat. I walked all the way down south, wheeling up all Wetzel Street, clear down to Benwood, out Boggs' Run, go on the other side, on the other side of Boggs' Run, on the hillside, when the tabernacle came floating down the river. <laughs> That's where I was at that time. I'm young, the only story that I know of the 1936 flood was told to me by my grandfather. And he was about 12 years old at the time. And he was asked by his father to go to his uncle's house on Wheeling Island and help his uncle move all of the furniture from the first floor to the second floor. And um, he had you know, no worries about this. He just started walking and finally he got to the island, to his uncle's house, began to move the w heavy wooden furniture to the second floor. And they're very concerned about this furniture, had been in the family for, for years. So they were working diligently and ignoring the water outside. Well, by the time they looked outside, the water had reached the first floor and they were stranded on the second floor for days without food, without heat, and the only thing that my grandfather was wearing, uh, you know, were some pants and a woolen sweater that was worn out. And um, he never complained about this. He just sort of accepted it. And I think that maybe it is his personality, but more, I think it was the attitude of the generation that sort of ignored the fact that uh, people were suffering and just accepted the devastation and did what they could to help. The only thing uh, I know about the 36 flood is just the things that I've read uh, because I wasn't uh, around for the 36 flood, but it was Willing's worst flood to date. Over 17 people died in that flood. When you think of the water cresting at 55 feet, just imagine what 55 feet, how high that is. Most buildings are an average of 25 feet high, and that water crested 55. So you can imagine, as far as the island was concerned, there must have been water on the second stories of most of the people's houses. And it's just hard to imagine that much water coming in and covering and spreading out through the land. Just, uh, just devastating can't imagine sitting there and watching the water come up, not knowing how much water you're going to get. And before it's all said and done, it's practically in your attic. flood was the biggest flood we had here in Wheeling. Got up to 55 think, feet, I think it was, and Fritzy and I were married in 34. We were living in an apartment building on 16th Street downtown, 
and we had refugees from the flood in our apartment. We were on the third floor apartment. We had telephone operators, bakery truck drivers, we had everyone. And they were coming and going all hours of the day and night, you know, working shift work and stuff. And we got word that they thought the suspension bridge was going to go out, that the cables had broken off, some of the cables, and the rescue workers on the island needed food. So Fritzy, even though she was pregnant, made a big pot of vegetable soup. And we took it down to the bridge and sent it over to the island so they'd have something to eat while they were working over there. Part of my family comes from Benwood, and they got flooded nearly every year. And you knew where to put the piano. You had it down to a science of the heaters and the cooking and everything. How far up, and had it pretty well judged. And unless it was an unusually horrible flood, like the 36, he pretty well had it psyched out. So you were flood professionals. Of course, the 36 and 37 was out of anybody's range. But you hoped you had relatives on high land, so families dispersed to higher land. And my mother remembers how good the Red Cross was. We all had boats. And so at the time, the flood arose. My brothers were very busy taking everyone off the island. Many, many people they rode off the island. As the water would reach the person's house, then my brothers would go and take them off the island. And many people wouldn't let anyone except my brothers take their families off the island. That's what great river men my brothers were. Right. One story that I recall, a lady was saying that they lived next door to a firefighter in 36. And I didn't know this, but apparently the firefighters had whistles in their houses that apparently uh, was hooked up to the telephone poles outside and they'd send a signal and where you would think you know the firemen would have to be in a firehouse in order to hear the whistle they had individual whistles in in homes in the firemen's home so you could be laying in bed and all of a sudden that whistle would go off inside the house and I can't imagine what the sound must have been like because uh, the lady that was telling this story said that she could hear the whistle when she lived next door so I can't imagine how loud it must have been in that house. <laughs> Talk about an alarm clock. But uh, that was something that I wasn't aware people did. Uh, that's how they got a hold of their firefighters back then. Individual whistles in their house. I've been a farmer for, was a farmer for 31 years. And uh, when the floods would come, and the water was going down, we'd have to go out and pump basements out. And uh, like, well, I'll, I'll tell you, there was one place between uh, 23rd and 24th Street on Market. You go there and pump one basement out, and you would be pumping. But actually, you was draining three basements next door. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you'd be pumping that long, but you would be dr actually draining three basements. That was uh, on, uh, uh, Market Street between 23rd and tw uh, 24th Street. Uh, but uh, then when, uh, I mean, uh, after every flood, we had to go out and pump cellars out. That was, that was our job. I was born on October 5th, 29. And at the time of the flood, I lived on what was considered the lowest place on the island. It was on South Wabash Street the last house practically on South Wabash. And my strongest recollection is Paul Miller on WWVA was on the air continuous for like 72 hours dispatching rescue boats to people in South Wheeling, East Wheeling, and on the island. I can even remember the 1913 flood when I was very young. And an uncle bought me a pair of little boots about the size of a three-year-old boy would wear. And I thought that was wonderful. But over there, again, we knew how to prepare for a flood. We didn't keep much in the basement in those days because of the problem of the floods. In 1936, which is the great big flood, my father had just died a short time before that, and I was living at home. My mother was living there. We just stayed there the whole time to protect the house, but when the flood comes, the first thing we learned to do 
was to take the garden hose upstairs, put it outside the bathroom with a connection which would fit on the water spigot in the bathtub. So, if there was a fire, we could have our own little hose to squirt water. And also, when the flooding would recede, I could remember distinctly fastening up the hose and walking down the steps, squirting the hose on the walls to wash the mud out. We tried to keep up. the afternoon and the evening until it got dark yeah. and then my grandfather said all right you two boys uh, come with me we'll, we men will go sit in the kitchen and talk so we went in the kitchen with the lights out they they sat at the kitchen table and I sat in a chair by the back window at the back of the house I don't know how much time went by but the water was now up in the street rising pretty rapidly and you couldn't see much outside, it was very dark. My grandfather said something about, I think I'll turn on the light. And he reached up to turn on the light, which was controlled by a little chain, a little string. And that was the last thing I remembered until I woke up and I was hanging upside down in debris and I could see sky above me with both ankles pinned by some pipes. I suppose they were water pipes of, of the house. I don't know what, probably the water pipes. There was a gas main that ran under the sidewalk on Water Street, right past the corner of that house. And uh, evidently it was a leaker. No one had ever, we never wondered why nothing grew no weeds or grass grew on that corner. Now that same sidewalk, I was down there the other day, the same sidewalk is still there, the same bricks. And uh, so evidently it was thought that what happened was that as the water rose, it forced gas up through that sidewalk and it, it, it got up there, although none of us smelled anything. And when it reached the heating stove, which was a pot valley that you, you burn coal in, it exploded. My mother told me later that the house exploded twice, but in truth, I never heard a bang. I never heard anything. Uh, the house was blown into a big pile of debris. Uh, my grandfather, my older brother, or myself, we were not injured. Our clothes were ripped, that kind of thing. We were not injured. And uh, when I, I guess, when I regained consciousness, I heard the two of them standing down below me about, oh, probably 20 feet away, yelling at me, asking me where I was. And I yelled back and said, uh, I'm, up, I'm down in a hole here, my, my ankles are pinned. Uh, I got to see if I can get out because a boy nine years old, anything that happened, it was his fault. And I'm trying to get what I did to bring this about. And, I just and of course, houses were going down the river, chickens on top of the roofs. You could just see anything floating down the river. The only way you could get from Elm Grove to Wheeling was the B&O Railroad. It was just high enough above the water that they run a shuttle train from Elm Grove to Wheeling. All the roads were completely closed. But not only Wheeling, but Bridgeport, Martins Ferry, and Benwood, and Shadyside. The whole area was just completely covered with water. It's just hard to believe that that much water could exist. But since the new dams they put up and the new lakes throughout the state of West Virginia and Pennsylvania and Ohio, it's helped tremendously in checking the water and keeping it in its bounds. People that live in a flood district, I mean, it was just matter of fact. 
You have people over in that Wheeling Island that get flooded all the time, and you think, why do they stay there? Why do they live there? But see, that's their home, and so they just do. They go through moving all that up and putting up with the flood, and they tell you that there, there will never be a flood like the 36 flood since they put the dams in. But we had some pretty good floods, so I guess the dams can't control that altogether. But you know, it does get flooded through here sometime. I think one of the things about a river is it does what it wants. And so through the years, there have been mighty floods in the Ohio. We live here by the suffrage of the river. My great-grandmother died as a result of the 1884 flood. The family came back from Ireland in 1884, and a lot of Irish settled in South Wheeling in a little neighborhood down there. And right off there, they were hit with a very large flood, the 1884 flood. They went back into the house too soon, and she developed pneumonia and died. There was a large flood in, I think, 1914, and there have been other floods through the years, and of course we all know the stories of the 1936-37 flood. My mother lived through that flood, and we lost. What is so sad, we lost our heritage in that flood. And the, the old photograph albums, the things that were stored in the basement. My grandmother would not believe them when they said the water was coming. She would not leave the house until, I guess, they almost had to carry her physically. And I still miss the fact that I have no pictures. A part of my family history was taken by the river. One of the interesting things is the pianos. So many people had the pianos. And they said before flood, you would see these gangs of men up and down the streets moving the pianos. Most of them went into Ritchie School, apparently. We had a piano which was moved, and finally after the 36 flood, they got so tired of moving it that they just left it and gave it to the school. And I think the working class, a lot of them settled in South Wheeling, which, of course, was in a floodplain. And so they were prone to get the water. As I borrowed some boots from the fire department up there and was going around the corner, and I had this boy, Arlie Moore, on my back from the island. And as we come around there on Chapman Street on the corner, now the place is burned down, but the cellar door is still there, that I fell in the cellar door fell down in the cellar door with him on my back. Lucky there was a fella inside the beer joint there. It was Consumer's Cafe where he went and pulled me out like that there. But I, I was holding on to Arlie's hand and they pulled me out. The right, I went clear down the chute on down to the basement. But the place is still there. Coming across from the Bridgeport Bridge and this man, had Joe Christopher, had him on his back, this 10-year-old boy, and when he did, he stepped in a hole right off the, uh, the Bridgeport Bridge and uh, fell into the hole and the boy couldn't swim. And I had a boat right down a, a Virginia Street and my brother and I was trying out a boat, Jack and I. And as we was doing this here, I kept saying, where's that boy going? Jack says, it looks like he married. All you could see him is trying to get out of the way. I said, my God, he's drowned. So we took the boat and started up the river there. And I said, just keep pedaling, go on. I'm going to go get him, you know, like that. Or right before I got to him, about 10 feet before I got to him, he went under. I took off my shoes and he said, don't, 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 don't. You can't get him. I jumped into the water and it was over my head. And I was treading water and there I could see the face just looking up at me like that. And I grabbed him by the hair and I said, I got him, I got him. And he was pulling me under, and I can remember pulling me under like that there. And I was thought, wouldn't let go. He said, let go, you know, let go, you're drowning. And he put the oar out like that, and Jack and saved both of our lives, and we got in there, and Jimmy Luckett was the boy.
part of it went down the river, but the rest of it went and knocked houses down. And I get the pictures that shows where they knocked the houses down and different ones were there. And I even got pictures of two boys standing out there in the uh, street, and I'll get their names later to you. And uh, it shows an old piano sitting out there, a big baby grand piano with the great big, uh, you know, legs on that. There's a lot of stories about people helping people during the floods. And one story comes to mind. During the 1936 flood reunion, the first one that we had, there was an old gentleman came up from Moundsville that said during 36, he was 19 years old. And he came all the way up from Moundsville to help people move their stuff on the island. And I thought that was interesting that somebody would come that far to help people. Uh, and I guess it was a matter of, you knew you couldn't do it all on your own. So if you helped somebody, you hoped somebody would help you. Because when it came to moving your furniture, I mean, there were a lot of, a lot of elderly people, even men that were in good physical condition couldn't move some of the furniture, the heavy furniture that people had in their houses back in 36. So I think out of pure necessity, people had to help each other in order to get the job done. Because, you know, normally there was one man in a household. You were lucky if you had some sons that would be able to uh, be of age to help you out. But for the most part, you had to help each other. Because in order to get that stuff, you know, to higher ground or out of the house, you had to rely on your neighbors. I grew up in a, in a flood area, and, and they, the only thing I can, the things that I can remember are, when I was younger, it always used to come up and, and it'd be in our yard, and it would uh, also be in our basement, but I used to go out on the back porch with a, like a, a, a pole of some kind and some string and a hook, and I really thought I could catch some fish in my backyard. You know, and I used to sit out there. Now this is, I had to be, you know, seven or under. <laughs> My father had a business, uh, it was a bar, and it was on a street where it was like on a slant. It was going downhill. So the water would come up and it would get in the basement of the bar, but it wouldn't go in the first floor. But you could go out the side steps of the bar and sit on the steps. And I used to do that. The water would be up in the corner but I could be on those side steps and water would be all around me, you know, but I'd be like halfway out into the flood. And I used to sit there and just watch it. And uh, one day this, this board come floating by and there was a little cat on it. And I saved this cat. And I was about seven, eight years old, you know, and I, I my mother let me bring this cat in and, and I, we, it was all cut up and beat up and we kind of brought it around and I named this cat Willie. But the, uh, the cat turned out to have kittens, and we had to call it Wilma. <laughs> I remember more than anything, the floods. We had many of them. It seemed like we had uh, one or two every year, and they were uh, not the golly washers that you hear about today on Wheeling Creek. They were back up water from the Ohio River, and uh, one I remember more than ever was the 1936 flood. My father took me to McFadden's store and we bought uh, a pair of rubber boots so I wouldn't get my feet wet because uh, we were going down where the flood was and, and where I lived, uh, we were up on top of the hill so you know, we really didn't need them up there but uh, we definitely needed them down there in the flood. It was a big cleaning up job afterwards. As soon as the water was going down, uh, we went back to uh, clean up and Everybody who had a piano on the island, uh, the pianos, they were out in the middle of the streets and they were ruined. And uh, so many people lost their photos and their albums and, and uh, they were so important back then to people because it was in the 1930s and all we had was a, a box camera, black and white photos.
slowly recede, they leave in their wake heaps of debris clogging the streets of cities and scattered throughout the lowlands and valleys of 13 states. Nature, with the limitless power of water in a few brief hours, has wiped out the result of many years of labor by man. Torn by the frenzy of the flood waters of the Ohio River, West Virginia grimly and courageously sets about the task of rehabilitation faced by a sea of mud. In Wheeling, gangs of men labor everywhere, clearing mud from the streets. Workers in the service of public health, advance agents of rehabilitation, while others remove great piles of debris which clog the streets. They are WPA workers, bearing the brunt of relief. From the Ohio Valley to the coast of Maine, wreckage and devastation is widespread. People are hungry, they are homeless, families are separated, some of their members never to return. The problem of reconstruction and relief is urgent and immediate. With the drama of the emergency now past, the nation is faced with a gigantic task of reconstruction. The states appeal to the federal government for help. As the largest unit of the works program, the WPA, with its crew of able manpower, immediately swings into action. 275,000 men and women being assigned at once to relief work in all flood areas. Theirs is no simple task, no routine of duties. They are prepared to render quick and effective service wherever needed, from feeding the hungry to clearing the streets and restoring household goods. And mud is only one problem which confronts the WPA workers. Pumps are hastily installed and flooded cellars cleared of subterranean lakes. Lime is spread over infected areas where sewage and refuse threaten epidemic. The face of the ground is covered with slime. It becomes necessary to wash that face. Enormous as was the emergency, WPA was not unprepared. Weeks ago, there were indications of impending floods. Undramatically and quietly, WPA executives laid out plans for action when and if the moment arrived. Cities and towns made their best estimates and their requests were answered with $18 million worth of flood projects. It's not easy work, this job of re-establishing men and women in the everyday business of eating and sleeping. It's filled with all kinds of problems, but spurred on by the relentless efforts of the WPA Army of Flood Relief, the work of rehabilitation proceeds apace. Pitiful remnants of the homes of men are gaping reminders of the fury of nature unleashed. But behind it all is brought out the fortitude of mankind in emergency. Nothing can equal the spirit with which WPA workers assume the gigantic task which confronts them. In Wheeling and on Wheeling Island, the caprice of the waters has gone to unbelievable lengths. In many cases, the wreckage is of enormous weight. It becomes necessary to use the heaviest modern machinery in order to remove quickly the tons of debris which choke the streets and constitute a very real menace in case of fire or other emergency. Reclamation is the hardest job of all, calling for hours of persistent labor amid depressing surroundings. Courage is repeatedly demanded and repeatedly delivered. The WPA workers face a huge task, a task to be done efficiently and with no hope of special reward. Nevertheless, they welcome the job for its pay they're earning, and not the dole. Homes are left buried in mud in many sections of the city, and hours of work are necessary before they may be cleaned sufficiently to be occupied. Mud carpets the lower floors of dwellings and has to be removed with shovels. So it was said that in the 1936 flood, some historians say that that was one of the reasons why Wheeling's population started to decline. Because after the 36th flood, there was so much devastation and so many businesses along the waterfront area had lost so much that it began to make people think twice about staying in Wheeling and doing business in Wheeling. Because when you figure, if you lost everything in the flood, if you had a business and you lost it in the flood, why would you stick around? And, and it's like earthquakes. 
You know, people say that once they've been in an earthquake, the ground never seems to feel stable under them. And I think that's what happened to a lot of people during 36. Once they went through that type of devastation, sure, there was a lot of people that stayed, a lot of people, especially ones on the island who have lived through floods over and over again, but a lot of people just, that was it. They packed it up, said, I don't want to go through this anymore. flood we also still lived on 27th and Chaplin Street and uh, we knew it was going to get into our house um, so but my mother didn't want to leave the house so she just went upstairs and I'm not sure who all helped me but my mother and my brother and my dad and I we moved our furniture off of the fr up put it up on things on the first floor and I remember we're walking around in um, hip boots that guys used to wear, um, go wear when they went fishing and I had those on walking in the house and it, in the end the water was three feet in our first floor of our house but it receded very quickly so it wasn't you know I mean but the house was still damp and everything inside for months afterwards. I lived in, I was working at the High Valley Medical Center and uh, a very nice man came in a rowboat and he picked me up and he'd row me up to past 27th Street and I'd get out and go to work and then when I was ready to come back home, he was there waiting for me to bring me back home. Row me back down to the steps. <laughs> we had a boat and we were out in it and um, a friend of ours who, who lived on the far south end of the island was staying at our house because it wasn't going to get into our house and um, we took him to his house to check on it one day and the day of I guess the flood was at its highest and I think it was Fink Street on the island. When we got there, we were even with the street sign in that boat. And that is, was just totally amazing to me that that water was that deep and we were that high, you know, that we were as high as that street sign. We were in a rowboat uh, going up uh, to the north end of the island when we uh, went by a house that was uh, unfortunately on fire and uh, we had stopped there to um, uh, see what was going on and the, the firemen were uh, diving under the water to try to turn the gas off and uh, and uh, that type of thing and it was it was pretty dramatic um, when we were leaving there um, we were coming south on uh, North Huron Street and the current was so strong um, it was pulling us from the front river to the back river every time we went through an intersection. And uh, my brother-in-law was rowing the boat, and uh, at, at one point the current was so strong that he, he was rowing very hard and the uh, oar lock broke, and he flipped completely out of the boat, uh, which the water was only about four feet high, but 
what happened was it, it, it took us in the boat, my sister and myself, and it was taking us out to the back river and we had no uh, oars. <laughs> so we grabbed onto a stop sign and we were holding on to that while he uh, got the oars and kind of uh, waded over and, uh, and kind of rescued us. The flood of 96 uh, started out with creek warnings, that the creeks were expected to uh, rise, and th those do come rather quickly. We'll have five or six or seven feet of, of uh, increase in the flood levels along the creeks within hours, and people don't have much time but live in low-lying areas. What had happened was uh, all the blizzard snow that had occurred, uh, followed by some uh, 60 near 70 degree temperatures that melted it all very quickly. Uh, and then heavy, heavy rains that occurred not only here but also in the uh, contributing tri tributaries to the Ohio River. Uh, ordinarily when the river has flooded, uh, you know, very commonly it will be the Allegheny, maybe, maybe the Monongahela uh, that flood, that contribute to uh, the flooding, and uh, there's more uh, time notice, which we didn't have th this time. So it was uh, a Friday morning. Uh, the only thing we had at, at Friday morning was the expectation of the creek flooding. In fact, the, the, the creeks had reached a maximum level and we were anticipating them to begin to recede. By noon on Friday, events had, had changed so dramatically along the Yakagani River, along the Monongahela, along the Allegheny, along all of different kinds of creeks and, and areas uh, with, with all of the melt and very severe rains that, that the, uh, we knew that the river was going to come up. Uh, the National Weather Service, uh, as well as the Corps of Engineers, gave us notification uh, before noon on Friday that uh, we were expecting the river uh, to flood, to exceed uh, flood level. So we began to prepare with the Office of Emergency Services uh, uh, to get information out to the public and prepare uh, for uh, the, the river flood. The f normally, uh, I think from past experience people have had another day to prepare for a river flood, uh, but a series of events uh, that seems unusual didn't give us that extra day. We, we had from Friday noon until uh, it was during the day Saturday when the, the water spilled out of its banks uh, and it crested uh, through the night, Saturday night, Sunday morning. Uh, all of those events included all of the different rivers that, that came up, not just one or two of them. All of the creeks were already swollen, so there was not places for river water to back, back channel, seeking its own level back into the contributing uh, uh, creeks uh, that flow into the river or other rivers. Uh, the enormous amount of snow, the fast melt, uh, all of the rainstorms that occurred, and then uh, freezing weather, which created some ice damming several places. Uh, there were, uh, uh, and then as, as things would occur and the ice jams would would burst, the water would swell, and it created a very difficult time for the National Weather Service and the Corps of Engineers to predict with any accuracy at all uh, an, expect, an, an expected uh, crest level. Uh, you know, they explained to us that that's why there were so many fluctuations of, of, of uh, 41 feet, 44 feet, 46 and a half feet, 51 feet, and we can come back to that, uh, and then back down to uh, uh, 48 and a half, uh, and, and it ultimately it, it crested at 46.09 uh, feet at the Wheeling Wharf uh, in the middle of the night, uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning. Um, it was it was a, an unexpected, unusual chain of events that, that created those difficulties for people to forecast to us with any with any uh, accuracy. The old timers know that uh, the Wheeling flood is just always 10 feet higher, and a couple days later than Pittsburgh.
whatever the Pittsburgh flood level is, add 10 feet, that's where we are. And I think that's about where it, 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 uh, it ended up. I, I don't recall exactly what the uh, Pittsburgh crest was. Um, but, you know, the old timers are, are usually right on. Uh, this, this was my first experience with a disaster of this nature a, a, as mayor. Uh, I've been active with the city when other events have occurred, such as the uh, Ashland oil spill uh, that occurred in 1986, I believe it was. Um, and I was you know, very active with the Office of Emergency Services, uh, you know, worked the phone banks with public information. So um, I've, I've had some experience with dealing with, with crisis situations and emergency situations. Uh, but this is the first in the office of mayor uh, that I've had to, uh, to deal with, uh, with the flooding situation. And I've got to take this opportunity to salute all of the, the city employees uh, that really responded very well. And, and it involved everybody. Uh, street department, sanitation, uh, the uh, police departments with notifications, fire departments and, and, and emergency preparedness, which is, which is their business, uh, and, and others, uh, people that work in other sectors of the city that when they got off work came and volunteered to help work the uh, public information phones and, and do other different kinds of things to, uh, to be helpful in preparing and then doing uh, uh, the work of, of cleanup. Um, and remember that, that our street folks were still exhausted from doing 14 and 15 hour days pushing snow and, and cleaning up from a blizzard. When the water came up, they really didn't even have a chance to rest. Right back out they were you know, to deal with uh, uh, flood cleanup. The sanitation crews would uh, do their normal routes for garbage and refuse collection during the, the morning and uh, in the afternoon. And then as soon as they completed their routes, they did not go home. They were reassigned to Wheeling Island and to Center and South Wheeling to assist the street department and others in, in the, uh, the cleanup. Um, we had excellent, excellent response from our governor uh, and from the President of the United States with regard to this flood. Uh, I think other areas have had experienced some difficulty with getting response, uh, in, uh, federal and state uh, uh, response in, in Pennsylvania and Ohio, I know that to be the case. Uh, I think the difference here is we were prepared knowing that the governor was going to be asking us, what do you need? Uh, how, do you, how do you respond? What do you need to, to help? And I knew to say I need 10 front end loaders and I need 25 dump trucks and I need 100 people uh, from the reserves or uh, the National Guard or wherever you can uh, assist with people just right off and we need pumps. Uh, we need generators, we need that kind of equipment, very specific information. Uh, the governor uh, was not making hasty calls to the president, but uh, called as soon as he had good, solid assessment of what the need is, contacted the president. Um, uh, I delayed a trip to the U.S. Conference of Mayors by a couple of days. I just couldn't leave town with the flooding going on, uh, but did get over there, uh, met with the president on uh, Thursday, uh, right after, in the week after the flooding. Uh, the president already had the information and had already notified FEMA that he wanted them to complete the paperwork because that day he wanted to sign the emergency declaration and for them to bring the, the papers. That is a tribute you know, not only just to the president's willingness to, to do that promptly, but to the governor's willingness to do, do the work well, properly, good solid assessments, uh, and the willingness of our people in city administration uh, to give me the numbers that I needed to say to the governor, we need these items. Uh, this, is, this is the help we need. Here's the situation. So at all levels, people worked very well. And, and my hat is off to the governor for doing it right. My hat is off to the president for providing the, uh, the very prompt, uh, you know, within hours response uh, to the emergency uh, uh, that, that we were having here in town. All those people make my job enormously uh, a lot easier uh, than, it, than it could be uh, with, without that kind of, a, of assistance. I know other areas have had uh, trouble with, with people saying we need help and the people in the position of providing help say what do you need and they say we don't know but we need help and, and they can't respond. Uh, and then they yell at somebody else or blame the president or blame somebody uh, and that, that's not how it works. You know, our, our folks did it right. Uh, I'm, I'm enormously uh, pleased. I'm, I'm one happy mayor. Uh, with an excellent governor who gave us good, solid support and, and has uh, made the response to our folks prompt, efficient, and effective. We still have a lot of work to do uh, as, as we record this, uh, and we'll get on that. A lot of the mud has been frozen with <laughs> some severe cold weather that we're going through right now, and that hampers the cleanup. 
Uh, a lot of the, the trash that's been thrown out and debris from the flood uh, was wet and it's all frozen together and we can't just go in and pick it up. It, it's hand work, stick work, and some of it we have to beat on it to break it apart so it's workable by the street crews to pick it up and throw it on a refuse truck or on a street department truck to haul it away. Uh, but we're, we're getting there and our folks are just doing tremendous work. I was uh, contacted by uh, CBS News that they were interested in doing uh, a, a live uh, uh, broadcast from flooded areas. Uh, the information I had was the time of day and so forth in the morning and the best place to do that to have a view would be at the Point Overlook Museum. Uh, so we made contact with uh, Chip West uh, about you know, using the, the Point Museum uh, uh, as, as, a, as a station to, to do the, uh, that interview. Uh, and of course, uh, you, that, that was available. Uh, we, uh, CBS made arrangements with the folks from Huntington, a Huntington CBS affiliate that has the equipment to do the long distance uh, uh, satellite broadcasting um, uh, to New York for the broadcast. It was three or four minutes. It wasn't terribly long, but uh, you know, it gave an opportunity to, to tell uh, to the nation uh, something about the spirit of our wheeling folks here. Uh, th th this is who we are. You know, the flood comes, and yes, it's a disaster, but we're going to take care of each other, and neighbors take care of their, their neighbors, and, and uh, we're survivors. We'll, we'll get through this, and, and anything else that comes our way, we'll, we'll survive, and uh, uh, we're looking to a bright future. You keep going your way, I'll keep going my way. River, stay away from my door. Go on. <laughs> you ain't got a cabin. You don't need a cabin. River, stay away from my door. Don't come up any higher. I'm so all alone. Keep my bed and my fire. That's all I own. I'll keep breaking your heart. Do you break my heart? Rivers, stay away from my door. <laughs>